Alex here with another video on high conflict child custody. This video is going to be on vexatious litigants. Um, I think that, in my experience, this term is thrown a lot, thrown around a lot. It was thrown around a lot in my case at first, and um, my ex's attorney didn't like that I was filing a lot of motions, and she wanted to have me declared um, a vexatious litigant. Her um, motion was denied, and she never tried again. But um, you do need to look into how this is defined in your state because my understanding is that it, there's no universal definition of, of a vexatious litigant or how they're dealt with. But if you if you have an ex, um, see a lot of people think that abusive exes come to court and file things like crazy and harass you with the court system. But you're just as likely to find an ex who hates the court system and finds every way to abuse you or your children outside the court system. And that thus forcing you to be the one to file all the motions to try to stop them. And then they can turn around with their attorney. This is especially effective. They can turn around with their attorney and say, he's filing all these papers, he's harassing me, and I'm having to pay all this money in attorney's fees and such. So in Nevada, at least, a vexatious litigant is a person who repeatedly files pleadings without any reasonable basis. You don't have to lose a bunch of pleadings because you can have a reasonable basis for filing papers and pleadings but lose them. Um, but you have to actually be abusive to the point that you're filing papers and pleadings that have no basis at all um, just with the goal of forcing your ex to oppose them and show up in court. This is actually in Nevada, uh, this is a really high standard but um, I don't know if the district judges actually follow the standard um, as set forth by the Supreme Court. I'm not going to cite the cases because these law changes, and I've always mentioned that it's good for you to do your own research, but there's cases, and there's at least two in Nevada, that articulate with specificity, specificity and detail what the criteria that the district court has to address before declaring a person a vexatious litigant. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I'm not sure if the district courts follow the criteria carefully, and I've seen definite examples where they don't and they declare a guy vexatious just because he isn't paying his attorney's fee uh, his ex's attorney's fees or I mean things that have nothing to do with vexatious filings just trying to say the guy is annoying and therefore he should be declared a vexatious litigant the problem with that is vexatious litigants have their access to the court system restricted so um, I've mentioned before that there are certain sensitive issues that you can win on appeal more more uh, frequently than others, and one of those is awards of attorney's fees, at least in Nevada, and vexatious litigant declarations are another one of those um, things that you can more easily get reversed on appeal just because the Supreme Court so strictly controls when and how you can do that. Um, again, I just want to reiterate, if you're in another state, you need to look at that carefully. The reason that this is an issue is, number one, if you're representing yourself and your ex is an attorney, not every time, but sometimes, and dare I say most of the time, that attorney is going to characterize you as annoying, um, harassing, um, as, as trying to just spend all of your ex's money because you don't have a lawyer and she does. And if you allow yourself to be declared vexatious and you don't oppose it in court and you don't appeal it, you aren't going to be able to go back to court and file pleadings and papers when you start to see things happen to your child. And um, if your ex is abusive, the second you have one of these put on you, they are going to start doing all kinds of crazy things just because that's how they are. They're exploitative. So I wanted to talk about these because it can be really scary when you see one. Um, I, I think that I want to reiterate one more time. If you don't have an attorney and your ex does, within the second or third filing, you're going to see this phrase getting thrown around. And the purpose of this video is to educate you on what it is, um, on how rarely it's supposed to be used, and on how totally damaging it can be on you if it is imposed on you. Um, I just want to remind everyone that even though my ex's attorney tried to have me declared vexatious once, she failed and she never tried again. So in my case, I never had to deal with it, but um, if, you, if this happens to you, you're not going to be able to file anything without permission from the judge. And it's just going to, to really, really slow you down and um, it's going to stain your name. When you ever, whenever you try to go back, even if the judge does decide to hear you on any subsequent motion, that's always going to be hanging over your head. That's always going to be used against you and thrown against you. So if I was going to reduce this video into a nutshell, um, always fight vexatious litigant declarations. Um, always oppose um, your ex's characterization of you as a vexatious litigant. And um, try to focus on the case law. And specifically, you should be able to find some case law that mentions 
um, that losing your motions isn't enough. You have to be losing motions that you have filed without any reasonable basis, and that is a hard standard because um, people lose motions all the time, especially non-attorneys, but very few people file motions just to be just to force your ex to respond. Most people, they're wrong, but they had an intention there. Something was going on, and they were concerned, and they wanted it addressed. And if that's the case, um, then you are not a harassing filer, and you should oppose that. And ultimately, if, it, if you fail um, and it gets imposed on you anyway, you should look into appealing it. And with that, I'm going to end this video.